So hello, I'm editor of the bookseller, Philip Jones. I'm just going to wait a couple more minutes for um, some more attendees to join because it can take a little bit of time to get everybody on board. And then I'll introduce you to um, day four of Springboard, our online conference organised with the Booksellers Association, talking all things spring and books. And I will at the end of um, the session, not now, because it might distract you, but at the end I'll post a link to um, the Springboard Supplement that we published this week with the bookseller, which includes a whole new and different raft of authors and author profiles that we've done uh, in collaboration with some publishers, but also with our, um, our author interview team. I think there's about 20 interviews with authors in, in those pages. Um, so, and that's being published with the bookseller this week and we'll go out to, anyone registered for this event. So let's kick this off now, I think. Uh, so I'm going to introduce uh, Uli Lovett, who's a bookseller from Gaze the Word, and uh, he's talking with the bookseller's paperback previewer, Alison Flood. So over to Uli to start this session. Hello, um, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Um, uh, as Philip said, my name is Uli, and I'm a bookseller at Gaze the Word, and a uh, book um, uh, reviewer, author interviewer. Um, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, for um, today's Springboard session, which is paperback preview, I'm joined by Alison Flood um, of the Bookseller and of The Guardian. Hello, Alison. Hi there, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I'm really looking forward to talking about some books with you. I know, I'm so happy to see a real bookshop in my screen. It's been a while. <laughs> It's, it's a nurturing site. We, uh, we we can't wait to reopen. And, you know, it's been a very intense time uh, here. We just principally be doing kind of web order fulfillment. And I haven't had a lot of time to think about the future and think about reopening beyond just kind of standing still with kind of fulfilling all the orders that we've been very grateful to receive. So this initiative where we can kind of lay out some kind of key titles that you've read and you've loved um, uh, for other booksellers um, is absolutely fantastic. So um, let's uh, let's kick off, shall we? Um, your first book, um, appropriately, seeing as we're kind of bringing bringing light 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 towards the future of what's coming out, is a book called Under the Stars: A Journey into Light by Matthew Gore. Tell us about it. Yeah, so I first read this kind of in the in the depths of winter and it seemed a weird book to enjoy so much when it was so dark, but it's all about getting out and making the most of the night. So it starts, the author is chatting with his with his kid who says who says that tells him that the average human will spend 26 years of their life asleep. And the start, the kid isn't meaning it kind of as a rebuke or anything like that, but but he kind of takes it that way and he thinks, God, I'm only living half a life, and it opens as he goes out for this walk in a snowy forest and he just describes it so beautifully it drew me in instantly but the whole book is kind of a celebration of night and what we're missing if we don't get out into the night and appreciate it so kind of from the animals that he sees like dog otters playing in a stream or the places that he is like an island on the Hebrides where he's or even like on, on the Suffolk coast he's watching the sun go down and, and the night begin he's got the most beautiful prose and it's just sort of like sinking into into nature but in, in a different way to lots of the nature books because it's it's about a time rather than a place or rather than a particular creature it's it's just wonderful it, it sounds like a really beautiful kind of i know atmospheric kind of twilight kind of like portal into 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 the nature kind of genre it, it sounds really kind of special and beautiful mm. you obviously loved it um, so um uh, that's published um by elliot and thompson which is distributed by Macmillan. Um, and, um, and I guess a lot of people are kind of kind of going to be kind of hankering for a like, connection with the natural world, everyone being locked down so much. So I think that one will be really, really popular. So that's out on the 4th of February. Mm -hmm. Next, we're moving on um, to something that looks very moving and very, very touching. Um, a Short History of Falling by Joe Hammond, which is subtitled Everything I Observed About Love Whilst Dying. Tell us mm. about this I don't know if you, you you may have read some of his columns in The Guardian uh, that Joe Hammond wrote before he died. So um, he was diagnosed with motor neurone disease and it's a sort of it's a record of how that progressed. So just from sort of slipping over at home, a diagnosis, how he and his family come to terms with um, with what's going on. He's got two little kids 
um and it's, he i mean he writes it it's like the book is the process of saying goodbye as he goes from clumsiness to a wheelchair to being immobilized in his bed and he's an incredible writer it's really moving it's a really it's an incredibly generous insight into life and the leaving of life. And the paperback has got a foreword from from his wife, Jill, about kind of the last moments of his life. But honestly, it's um, the, at the end, he's writing with um, with a camera attached to a computer, which is tracking the movement of his pupils um, for for the last few things that he that he says. And this, I wanted to read you a tiny bit that he's talking about his little son. And he says, Jimmy was at my bedside a few mornings ago, dispensing imaginary ice cream. I was staring upwards and I could hear him low down to my right. I opened and closed my mouth to show that I was eating some of the vanilla on offer, but silent and motionless. I don't know if he noticed. And then I heard him padding away into the next room. So he, he sort of finds some kind of, he finds some ease in where he is, but it's just, just he sees his life slipping away from him and carrying on and he just he's yeah like I said he he's very generous to give us an insight into these these very private moments I mean I know it's a cliche but sort of mortality memoirs memoirs about dying often can be incredibly life-affirming beautiful reading experiences because I, I, I suppose I don't know if it's true in this case but the author shares the, the joy of life do you know what I mean a sense of mm. Of 2020 about what what, what matters is, is, mm. is that kind and of even he, he finds the joy in in increasingly small things and he reminds you how lucky you are not to not to be in this situation I, I just think it's a very generous book and yeah like you said very life-affirming book as well it's beautiful it's drawing drawing comparisons with the diving bell and the butterfly okay so we're going to move on to um a book that you inspired me to read um, uh, being on your list it's the Midnight Library by Matt Haig, which is Canongate Books, um, which is out on the 18th of February. Um, so I read this on Saturday, um, uh, but I want to hear what uh, you think about it first. Tell me about it. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure everyone you. knows about it. It's, it's, it's doing really well at the moment, isn't it, anyway? But um, I just found it, I found it, I was completely charmed by it and um, completely cheered me up in, in a dark time. And I think that's probably why it is doing so well. So it's a story of Nora, who is everything's kind of gone gone wrong for her she's depressed she's lost her job all of the opportunities that she thinks that she should have taken whether to be in in a band or compete in swimming or any anything she, or, or get married she said no to all of those things and she thinks she's made the wrong decisions and she takes she takes the decision now that her life isn't worth living anymore and as she does that as she's sort of lying in between life and death she's taken to this this kind of library in her mind where she's given the opportunity to see what would have happened if she'd taken different pathways in her life and it's it's a massive wish fulfillment thing right we would all love to be able to do that but so she goes and she gets to be in the band and become an international superstar she gets to marry the guy she decided not to marry and see actually it wasn't that great after all and um yeah it's she's so lonely to start with and so miserable and uh, Matt Hay just sort of brings her to such a better place. So sometimes so humorously, like sometimes it makes you laugh out loud, the weird lives that she tries out. But yeah, it's, it's just great. What did you think of it? Um, it, it totally seduced me with its charm, its generosity. Um, I mean, it's really a book about, about kind of regret and recalibration of perspective. I love how it's kind of got this kind of like, yeah, sort of like, life version sliding kind of like mechanism to it um i love the uh, librarian uh, character in it who's kind of the overseer of this kind of like library space that lingers between kind of death and the afterworld um it's um, i think it's a you know reasons to stay alive is obviously a very very important book and i think this kind of like narrates kind of some of the ethics of that in a way that's going to be hugely accessible for a lot of people you know mental health is been testing in a huge way right now and a book like this that i think can affirm and, and kind of like hold people and and charm them is is really really needed and really really important and i absolutely loved it mm, yeah and he must have written it before any of this happened and yet it feels like it really speaks to this moment i think there's been quite a few fab books fab novels tackling loneliness lately and this is this and this is another of them I, I, yeah i think it's a lovely lovely book absolutely i'd like to Thank Canongate for sending me a copy to read. Thank you, Canongate. Okay, so <laughs> we are now going to move on to The Last Day by Andrew 
uh, Andrew Hunter Murray, um, which is like a future shock thriller published by Arrow, which is distributed by Penguin Random House. Tell us about this. Yeah. So I really love this. It's a debut and it's a really impressive debut. It's set in 2059 in a future where some kind of solar disaster has stopped the world from turning. So some of the world is in darkness and in disaster for that reason. And some of it is scorchingly hot. And so are kind of uninhabitable for that reason. And England fortunately happens to be in like this twilight zone where crops can grow and where people can live. Uh, so first of all, I just totally love that concept. I love a high concept thriller anyway, and a bit of kind of future um apocalyptic disaster always does it for me um anyway so we we kind of open we're on um a ship with a scientist called ellen who is um told by her dying university tutor that he needs to see her right now she needs to come back off this ship where she's gone she's sort of said enough with the world britain's kind of in this grip of this authoritarian government and she wants nothing to do with it but she's called back because of her dying university tutor and he tells her a secret that um is has devastating consequences and she has to kind of zoom around trying to find out more details while the government is trying to stop her so it manages to really well marry up the the high concept with the, the classic kind of thriller thriller chase it's a real escapist read i think it's fab okay you sound like you were gripped <laughs> <laughs> Pardon? You sound, you, sound, you, sound, you sound like you were gripped by this one. Definitely gripped by it. Took me away from all of the crap of, of everything today for, for a good <laughs> right. few days. A, yeah. <laughs> a good absorbing read and, and you know, escapist, like, you know, there's a, there's a big demand for that at the moment. Okay, yeah. uh, moving on. Little Disasters by Sarah Vaughan, which is Simon and Schuster Harper Collins. Now, this looks good. Tell us about it. So it's a thriller about the darker, dark impulses of motherhood, I guess you could describe it. It's told from the perspective of two women. There's Liz, who is a paediatrician, and her friend Jess, who's kind of the seemingly perfect mother of three kids, um, doesn't work, seems to have a perfect home life, who comes to the hospital where Liz is working with her little daughter, Betsy, who's, who's a toddler, who's bumped her head. And um, Jess is like, oh, she just fell. I don't think it's anything serious. But Liz does a scan and they find an injury that doesn't fit with what Jess is telling them. And they have to call in social services. Um, and it's sort of it's really, really shocking. It's about did a mother hurt her child or not? And it's exploring how hard it is to be a mum and the feelings that you can have, like how awful it is when your baby's just crying and crying and crying. And it goes back and forth between the two perspectives, revealing more about their past that might not be as they have said, and from the perspective of Jess's husband um, and what he knew about what really happened. So it's like, it's really shocking. It's really compulsive. You want to read it in one go because it's kind of so unbearably tense. Have you read previous novels by Sarah Vaughan? Um, yeah, I have. She's Anatomy of a Scandal, right? Yeah, tell us a little. I hear that's being adapted to into a Netflix series. Uh, just uh, tell us a little. Yeah, bit. I think it's happening at the moment. I think I saw her saying that they they were starting to think about filming now. I mean, wow, that must be that must be um, an intense experience. Right, exactly. So that's like a Westminster kind of scandal kind of intrigue. Yeah, a marriage, um, kind of a high profile marriage that the, the, the with political links um, and the husband is accused of something and the wife thinks that he's innocent and kind of how that pans out now is great. Fantastic, sounds it. Um, okay, another one that you inspired me to, Confession Time, I hadn't properly engaged with How Much of These Hills is Gold by C, C Pam Yang. Um, which is published by Virago, although my colleague at Gates the Word has been raving about it for ages. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I finally kind of managed to sink into 140 pages and absolutely love it, love the writing. It's amazing. Tell us about mm. it. Okay, so it's set like kind of at the end of the American gold rush. This is two kids, Lucy and Sam, they're Chinese immigrant siblings, and it opens as their dad has died and they become they believe that they need to put two silver dollars on his eyes in order for him to be properly buried but they're they're completely destitute they have no money so um sam the younger sibling holds up the bank and they end up having to flee into this utter dry western wilderness with the body 
of their dad, the rotting body of their dad, bringing it with them. And it's about, um, it's just incredible. It's, it's sort of riffs of classic stories of the American West, but with new protagonists from a new perspective. Her writing is kind of on fire. It's amazing. I, I've not really read anything like it. Um, and um, yeah, it's, so it's, it's an American West that isn't only populated by by white men. It's another side of it all. And she just she just brings it to life so perfectly. I mean, what, what did you think of it? I loved it. I loved the uh, the Chinese American representation. I love the gender queer representation. The writing, it 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 it's so evocative, so absorbing. You feel so present in the world that she's um, describing. Um, but at the same time, there's real kind of there's a real leanness and an economy to it. It's really sharp mm. and pro precise and really really honed. I, I, I long listed for the Booker. Um, mm. uh, yeah, absolutely adored. I can't wait to finish yeah. it. I, I spoke. Okay. To, um, I spoke to Pam. I just I'll tell you this because I thought you would be interested in it. I interviewed Pam about it, and she she told me that the, she wanted to make sure that in the first fifteen to sixteen pages of the novel, there are no gendered pronouns when it comes to Sam because she she can't. She felt like she couldn't affect how other people saw the character from people from that time, but she wanted to do everything she could to to let Sam present as they saw themselves before the world kind of impinges on all of that. And I think she handles all of that really super well. Absolutely, I I, I love how how stinking it is, um, um, and and how desperate it is, and um, you know, and even just these two children are alone in the wilderness, and and even mm. when it comes to drinking water and kind of the basics of survival and and then this the the, the the psychological dynamic between the two siblings it's just so good um so now we're going to move on to um uh, home stretch by graham norton uh which is published by coronet um and is distributed by hachette and this one is out um uh, towards the end of april tell us about mr norton's latest novel well I, I i mean i wasn't expecting that i would love this quite as much as i did it's set in a small irish town it's about um this boy connor who is in a car crash with some of his friends and the majority of them die and he's then sort of shunned by the town and by his family, his parents and his sister. He ends up getting sent off to uh, work on a building site in Liverpool where he discovers his sexuality, ends up going to London, um, has his whole new life and doesn't go, kind of forget, leaves his past behind, tries to forget about it all. But as in all good novels, it comes back to haunt him and he ends up going home. But um, well, I, I just found, I mean, he's such a warm writer. He, it, I, there's nothing better than a good Maeve Finchie if you really need to get away from it. And it just, it was, it had the, the affection for, well, nearly all the characters, not the really baddie ones, but everyone, he brings this like warmth and affection and light to his writing about them all. Um, and yeah, I, I just sank into it. I, it took me away from everything. I thought it was a really lovely novel. Yeah, no, I, I I really enjoyed it too. I think it's this the second novel um, uh, uh, by Graham that I've uh, I've read, and um, he's clearly a great storyteller. My colleague um, Jim, um, uh, who's Irish from Cork, also read it, and the way that um, Graham Norton captures kind of dialogue and conversation, especially kind of in the, in small town Ireland, mm. love the real ring of authenticity to it so um so he really yeah it's it. like sh it's shining a light onto these lives that are just normal everyday lives but but sort of making them glow with with the way that he writes about them i think it's a real he's got a real skill right and, and i love the fact that he's writing <laughs> he'll go he'll be, he'll be all right i love the fact that he's writing a major kind of commercial kind of novel with extensive gay content in it as well um yeah so, so graham um, so now we're going to move on to The Golden Rule by Amanda Craig, which is Abacus, uh, published by Hachette. Um, tell us a little bit more about this one. Strangers on the Train vibes. Definite Strangers on a Train vibes, a bit Beauty and the Beast as well. It's, it's, it's a really meaty, big novel to read, but it is so very, very readable. Um, so it's about this young uh, single mom Hannah, who's got a little daughter who's six-ish, and an absolutely terrible ex-husband who isn't giving her any money. She's totally poverty stricken, can't pay the rent or anything like that. She's getting the train to Cornwall um, for her mother. Her mother is about to die. And she meets um, she meets this very glamorous woman in first class called Ginny, who kind of calls her in there. And then Ginny, um, they, Ginny also turns out to have a terrible ex-husband and they ask, eventually they get 
to the point where she says, why don't we just kill each other's husbands? You can go and see mine. He's in Cornwall. I'll kill yours once you've killed mine. But then once Hannah gets there and she goes to this beautiful old kind of shabby old house and meets this guy there that she thinks is the caretaker, but turns out not to be the caretaker and realises that Ginny's story isn't quite what it might have been and then it's it's like it's a love story it's a it's a beautiful like evocative um look at cornwall but it's also really super contemporary and sharp on being very poor and be, on working as a cleaner on brexit on the divisions in cornwall between the tourists and the locals that live there that have no money so it's just it, yeah it's it's fantastic i really super recommend that one Fantastic. Um, so now we're moving on to three fifths. And by the way, it's a treat to talk about these with you. I live in a homosexual LGBT book ghetto. <laughs> so you've you've brought me out of uh, my, my small little kind of like genre and, and you're, uh, you're we're sharing about books that um, I don't normally kind of like read and engage with. So thank you for bringing some much, much, need, much needed refreshment into my mind with it. <laughs> Um, Three Fifths by John Vircher, um, Pushkin Vertigo, uh, published, uh, distributed by GBS. So um, race, violence, tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, it's it's a crime novel, but it's also it's not a not a whiz bang fast moving crime novel at all. It's about this young guy called Bobby who is white passing. His mum, who he lives with, is an alcoholic white woman, and his dad, who's black, is kind of not in the picture at all. And his best friend, it opens as his best friend Aaron comes out of prison where he, it turns out he's been radicalised and become like a white supremacist. So then on their very first like, evening together, Aaron ends up be almost beating this young black guy to death outside a restaurant. And Bobby kind of stands there, not sure what to do, should he intervene? He's, he's frightened, but he's also passive. And then the book kind of plays out as, uh, is the crime going to catch up with with Aaron and, and with Bobby, is Bobby is Bobby going to let his old friend know who he really is? Who really is he? Um, and it's set in Pittsburgh in kind of ninety five, I think. So there are race riots. There's OJ Simpson. It's um, it was a Sunday Times book of the crime book of the month. I think it was maybe it was I was it was shortlisted for the Edgar First Novel Award as well. It's it's really impressive as a debut and a really really interesting book but like I said it's not like fast moving bite your nails crime it's really thoughtful it's really really intelligent not that the the former can't be that as well <laughs> absolutely not um <laughs> and, and, and so the principal characters the, 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 they're kind of I'm asking are they, they do you kind of go into debates around their their sense of society ex accepting their kind of their by their 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 by by their by racialness. I mean, the mm, yeah, it's Bobby. Bobby, I think his grandmother is a bit of, or his grandfather possibly is a bit of a a racist, and so he doesn't really see he doesn't really accept the the black side of who he is. So yeah, it definitely explores all of that. It's really interesting. Interesting. Um, okay, now we're moving on to a memoir and um, and uh, and something that looks very powerful. Um, Glorious Rock Bottom uh, by Bryony Gordon, which is published by Headline and distributed by Hachette. So this is like an addiction memoir? Yeah, so Bryony wrote about her OCD in Mad Girl. I don't know if you if you read that one, uh, but this is about her... Sorry. Oh, no, no, go on, please. Um, so this is about her, her alcoholism. So she's sort of writing it when she's at the heights of being a best-selling author who set up this amazing thing called Mental Health Mates, which is getting people to, to walk together with other people who are struggling with their mental health and kind of talk out their problems. So she's kind of at a real career high, but she's also struggling with her alcoholism. And it's it's so honest about the places that she ends up, the drinking that she does because she doesn't want to be home with her little daughter and her lovely husband. Um, she just really delves into all of the things that have gone wrong for her because of it and how and she she takes you through kind of her her slow path to recovery and like I said about the Joe Hammond book it's it's so generous of her to give you these insights into what her life was like so, to be so honest about about what she's done and some of it which is which is horrible um it's just yeah it's a re I think it's a really important book I think it can make a difference to a lot of people to see someone who is so high profile talk so honestly 
about their alcoholism. And she writes really, she's really funny as well. In the middle of it all, she manages to be really funny. <laughs> Fantastic. So it's quite raw, real, but also funny. Mm. And it's a sobriety, a sobriety memoir like no other. It, it, mm. really yeah, well, that's uh, a good pitch. <laughs> fantastic. Okay, uh, moving on. Um, uh, back to uh, thrillers. Back to uh, back to fiction. Black River um, by Will Dean, which is a one world crime imprint called uh, Point Blank. Uh, blank, excuse me, and that's distributed by GBS. Tell us about this one, um, an, an intriguing suspense. Yeah, so Will is currently doing well with his standalone thriller, which is The Last Thing to Burn, which is absolutely brilliant read. But this is the third in his series about um, a deaf Swedish reporter called Tuva. So she has already solved two mysteries. This is her third outing. She's living in Malmö, uh, which is a big city. She's from like a tiny town in the north of Sweden. Um, when she gets the news that her best friend back in the town, uh, Tammy, has gone missing. So she goes back to this tiny town in the north of Sweden, which is surrounded by huge creepy forests and she starts to look into Tammy's disappearance but no one seems to care. She flies the town with papers, no one seems to listen. She discovers there are like drops of blood outside the food store where Tammy works. It's only when like a kind of more high profile person goes missing that people start to listen and then she kind of starts to dig into this nearby community that's called Snake River which is very creepy and claustrophobic and might have something to do with the disappearance so also at the time it's midsummer in Sweden so it's light nearly all the time up in the north there which somehow adds to the eerie and spooky feeling so it's just it's a really good crime series with a really good protagonist um and yeah I love it I'll read all of them <laughs> I, I haven't read extensively in kind of like Scandic kind of like crime but it, it, I don't know, like that genre seems very atmospheric. Like, at yeah, the the genre, very evocative. Yeah. yeah, and Will is interesting because he's not actually Swedish. He lives in Sweden and he's married to a Swedish woman. So he's he he told me I interviewed him and he told me he he's embarrassed that he would be embarrassed to be translated into Swedish. But <laughs> but I think he gets it all spot on. I think it's great. <laughs> So a bit of a change of setting. Uh, we're going to India now um, for Midnight at Malabar House by Vasim Khan. Um, tell us about this uh, this crime series. So Vasim writes the Baby Ganesh series, um, and this is his first historical crime novel. So it is set in, in 1949 Bombay, where the clock is about to go to midnight, and it stars... Um, India's first female police detective who's called Persis Wadia and she's there taking this kind of midnight shift because no one else wants to do it when she gets a phone call that this high profile British um, diplomat has been murdered and so she gets the case because she's the only person there she goes to his house and he's dead his trousers are missing so are some important files um, and she uh, starts to dig into it all working with this guy from Scotland Yard um, while all the time kind of the the men who she works with are trying to stop her or are underestimating her. She's very stubborn and fierce and um, uncompromising. And it's really cool to see her kind of kicking ass all around the place, taking no nonsense. Fantastic. It sounds absolutely brilliant. Um, OK, fantastic. So um, uh, I said, yeah, Hodder dis distributed by Hachette for that one. And then we're coming towards the end of uh, your little pick here. Um, and uh, we're going to end with Why We Swim um, by Bonnie Ch Chai. Um, tell us a little bit about this one. So this is another one that I read uh, deep in the middle of lockdown. And what I really wanted was to be able to go swimming. <laughs> yeah. and I I think that Bonnie, she really, uh, it's, a, it's a, bit of, a bit of memoir, it's history, it's celebration of swimming, it's journalism. Um, I loved it from the very beginning when she writes about she's sort of exploring why people ever started swimming why did people ever enter the water and she talks about how ancient drawings of swimmers were found on this cave in the middle of the sahara and the sort of story behind all of that and she talks about um this uh she goes to iceland to meet this amazing fisherman who um falls off a boat in the middle of the sea and swims more than three miles in like freezing water to survive, which is like seemingly impossible, but somehow he does it. So she interviews people 
she she digs into things like the history of the different swimming strokes um she just she just, it's just a celebration of of the water and of swimming and i think it's it's out in august isn't it i think it might be kind of the perfect time for it to, to hit shelves when that's what we'll all want to be doing yeah no, absolutely you know it, look, it looks really good what a great list you've been having fun reading and what, a, what an eclectic list but there you go <laughs> It looks like there's some real gems in there. So thank you so much for sharing those with us. Um, so um, as a little sneaky extra, um, um, uh, I thought you and I could talk about some of the LGBT plus titles which are coming up in the next few months as a little kind of like extra queer insight into what I Brilliant. Think let's, swap, let's swap hats and I'll be interviewer and you be interviewee. <laughs> so I'll, I'll whiz through these uh, 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 a little bit faster. Ooh. So the first one is, I'm not sure if you can see the resolution on my screen so much, I thought I'd do some covers, is Swimming in the Dark by Thomas Jedrowski. Um, uh, and uh, that um, is out from Bloomsbury. Um, and uh, this came out in February, so this is out now, um, and it's a, like a love story set in communist Poland in the 1980s between two young men who kind of find themselves at opposite ends of uh, a political outlook, and the the writing, like Thomas Jodorowsky, back, his background is law, um, um, lovely man, we did uh, a couple of events with him for, when this came out in hardback, the writing it feels like an instant classic. There's, it's just wow. so beautifully honed and carved. The, the 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 way these two young men eventually reach for each other is just so beautifully captured. They kind of after the, this agricultural camp that they meet, meet at, they they go kind of camping. Um, in the Polish countryside together and they go swimming in kind of like secret kind of um, like lakes and ponds and eventually reach out for each other whilst they're swimming and it's just beautiful. I like I completely. We're going to move on to the next one, um, which is um, No Modernism Without Lesbians. Um, oh, I lost my, uh, my images. Uh, this fellow, which is absolutely amazing. So this is kind of historical biography by Diana Suhami. Um, and this is published by Head of Zeus um, and distributed by Macmillan. And it's amazing. So it's basically focusing on the lives of four lesbians um, in interwar Paris and their connection with the burgeoning mod modernist movement. So um, it's Sylvia Beach, Raya, Natalie Barney and Gertrude Stein. Diana Suhami has an amazing talent for, for historical memoir. She has she, it's gossipy, but there's a, there's a there's a real lightness of touch. It's really really engaging. Absolutely adore. Have you read really? Diana Suhami? I haven't. It sounds fantastic. She's amazing. She's like a, a, such a gifted gifted historical biographer. Um, uh, so um, then we're going to move on. And I've not read all of these. Some of them I have. Some of them I haven't. But I've just kind of got my little witchy sense that um, they're going to be absolutely amazing. Um, this one, Plain Bad Heroines, which is published today um, and is uh, written by Emily Danforth, um, 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 who also wrote The Miseducation of Cameron Post, which was turned into a film. This looks amazing. Okay, let me <laughs> see if I can find Hope from Sarah Waters. Brimming from start to finish with sly humour and gothic mischief. Danforth herself describes this um, as a um, kind of, ooh, what, what, what was the word she used? A, a big weird book. So it's set in a girls boarding school um, 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 and with events that happened about a hundred years ago, um, which ended up with a number of students dying and the school being closed down. And then it flashes forward to a movie being made about those events a hundred years later, but things start to go a little bit creepy and the the illusion between what happened and what is happening starts to blur it looks absolutely amazing i can't wait to read it, it looks really it's wow. a big one uh, yeah pages so that's horror back and then we move on to all boys aren't blue by george m johnson which is out in march published by penguin penguin have a big campaign for this one um, this is uh, the first uk publication of this but it, it was already out in the states and it's a kind of ya memoir about being black and queer um, it deals with quite a lot of intense topics such um, as homophobia assault 
abuse. So it's um, it, 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 it's kind of a primer for some of the darker, more challenging issues around kind of like the intersectionality of blackness and, and, and queerness um, and, uh, and homophobia and, and, um, and, and different kinds of intense themes like that, but really, really important book. So this one's out, um, uh, as I said, um, uh, in, uh, in March, actually it's out today. This is publication day, happy publication day, George M. Johnson. Um, and now we're gonna move on to Pull of the Stars by Emma Donahue. Did you did, did you manage to have a little glance I've at this not one? had a chance yet. It's, on, it's ready to go on my bedside, but I'm really looking forward to this one. Okay, it's really, really amazing, um, but it's a little harrowing in places. So huh. um, this was written well before COVID hit, but it's um, set um, on a very small um, maternity ward in Dublin during the 1918 pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, um, the, there are some intense scenes because it's on a maternity wall, really told there are some fantastic characters in it. There's a great love story. There's also kind of like the ricochet effects to kind of the, the First World War that are going on. So um, I really, really love Emma Donahue's writing. I think she's amazing. Brilliant. Uh, okay, moving on to Secret of Superhuman Strength, uh, which is the new Alison Bechtel. Um, the, um, and uh, she's kind of turning attention to fitness and keep fit in this one. Um, uh, obviously, Bechtel of the uh, uh, of the uh, um, Bechtel test. Um, about have you heard about the Bechtel test? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In literature. Yeah. Do you, do you know? Have you heard about the Bechtel test? You know about it. Okay, fantastic. So we're running out of time, so I might skip through this pretty quickly. This is Felix Ever After, which is a trans black. Um, YA novel, um, which is uh, which is coming out in May, um, and then we move on to the Pink Line, uh, which is absolutely incredible. Which is published by um, uh, um, uh, Profile Books and written by Mark Gervaisa. And this is an extraordinary kind of journey into like politicized non world. It's an extraordinary primer if you really want to understand kind of present kind of contentions around sexuality and gender identity right throughout across the globe. Um, um, Mark spent years researching and forming the achievement. I absolutely loved it. I found it incredibly clarifying. Um, and then there's a new poetry collection by moving from talking maybe arguably more about the body and desire to an exploration of kind of issues around mental health. Um, Andrew McMillan is an extraordinary, extraordinary poet. And I, and I can't yeah, wait for this yeah. to come out. Absolutely beautiful. Um, I don't need to talk about this one for too long. The, the empress of my soul is Ali Smith. Um, <laughs> so we have summer coming out um, in, um, from Penguin also in May. And it's uh, an astonishing end to an astonishing quartet. Um, 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 Thank you, Ali Smith, for, for, for everything you give me always. <laughs> uh, and then I don't know if you've heard of this YA novelist, um, Simon James Green. He is um, absolutely fantastic, British YA writer. Uh, this is the, You're the One I Want, which is out in June. Um, I'll just read you what Simon said about um, um, uh, the book. It's um, best described as the cast of Sex Education put on a production of Greece meets Bridget Jones <laughs> if Bridget Jones was a gay teenage boy who couldn't be asked to keep a diary. <laughs> Amazing. Um, uh, <laughs> I absolutely love he's um, Simon James Green is the king of um, kind of exploring kind of like geeky um, slightly kind of like shy embarrassed gay characters which is something that I kind of personally relate to quite well um, I don't know if you can tell um, next up um, we're moving on to June we're almost done filthy animals which is I'm so excited about I read a couple of these uh, last night so this is a new interlinked short story collection um, by Brandon Taylor, who is the author of Real Life, which was obviously shortlisted for the Booker. Brandon is an incredible, incredible writer. If anybody um, feels the same way about real life as I do, um, uh, 
they'll understand kind of this extraordinary kind of forensic nuanced involved dark kind of like quality in the writing absolutely exceptional and we're going to end with a dutiful boy paperback release of um Moshin Zedi's extraordinary extraordinary memoir um which is published by Vintage beautiful ultimately redemptive challenging but abounding with love and light um, um absolutely amazing so that's my that's my little kind of queer picks Brilliant. Well done. You got through them all very well. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to both of you. I could, I could have listened to that for hours. Um, and I love the way that you reversed the conversation midway through. Uh, definitely, uh, we'll try and do that. Uh, also, actually, I love that you picked books that appeal to the psychodrama of your life. As it is. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I thought there's quite a lot of thrillers in there, aren't there? <laughs> And also, about really, the really trials of motherhood. <laughs> really, I'm really glad that you put the Alison Bechdel book good because um, she's one of the authors that we have interviewed in our Springboard Supplement uh, that we're publishing this week. I'm going to post the link to now for um, our audience Brilliant. to click through to and, and read in all their glory. Um, but otherwise, my job here is just to thank you both for that expertise, the, the, the conversation, the uh, just, just the way you did it. And the, the, sh the I mean, we've had it all week with our previews and the books, but the sheer enthusiasm and knowledge that shines through, even though you're all, and I find this a lot, reading books all the time as part of your jobs, your just pure sort of passion for those books is still there. Which I think yeah. uh, is is remarkable, and that's what we've heard today. So, so thank you both very much. So tomorrow we've got um, our final springboard session, which is uh, we have seven authors who are popping up to um, to recount their odes to booksellers, uh, which is they are well worth. I've read them. I think they're well worth listening to, um, and it's all about spreading a little bit of love and affection to booksellers who, as we know, are suffering at the moment. Um, because of non-essential retailers being closed. And, and as Alison mentioned, I mean, seeing that tiny glimpse of the gaze, the word bookshop there is a, is a, is a sort of a window into a, a, a promised land that we all hope to get to at some point uh, over the next few weeks. So thanks. I'm, I'm, nest, I'm nestled in my favorite corner, which is lesbian fiction. <laughs> I'm also I'm also pleased to report that uh, despite being in central London, the Wi-Fi is as bad as it is everywhere else. So, uh, that's, that's <laughs> well, were we a little stuttery? Uh, you froze at one point, but it was it was all fun. You got to it. Could still hear so, everything. Uh, yeah, we could hear it. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Uli and Alison, and um, thank you to the attendees today. And I look forward to seeing as many as you as we can do um, tomorrow. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.